Please come in and take your seats. We're ready to get started with our NASA Town Hall. Victoria, did you want Jim to go first, or do you want? It doesn't. It doesn't do. Okay. All right. Great. Hi, Jim. Good to see you there. Hey, how's All it right. going? Please gather. We're going to have our NASA Town Hall now, and we're very fortunate to have with us today. Uh, uh, virtually, we have Jim Green from NASA headquarters, uh, SMD, the Planetary Science Division director, and uh, here in person we have Victoria Friedenson. Uh, from the Advanced Exploration Systems Division of the Human Exploration and Missions Operations um, side of uh, NASA. So we're going to start first with Jim Green, and then Victoria will follow. I think we should take questions at the end for both of them. What do you think? Jim, how, how do you feel about that? Would you rather take questions after your talk or at the end of both? Matters not. Oh, we cannot hear Jim. Uh-oh. Can you hear me now? No, we cannot hear you yet. Um, our tech staff is working on it. <laughs> All right. I was talking to Rick a minute ago. <laughs> That's not the right answer. OK, uh, we're still working on this. Just be patient. Stand by. We have wow, the technology. OK, I think you can hear me now. There you go. OK, very good. OK, great. So Jim, can you stay with us for the entire time? Yes. Okay, good. Then we'll take questions at the end of both of your talks, if that's okay. All right, so without further ado, please welcome Jim Green. Yeah, I'm really very, very sorry I wasn't able to make it to Ames this week. A great Phobos um, a conference that happened earlier and all the great sessions that are going on. From um, now, is that working? Yes. Um, I can, all right, super. Yeah, so very sorry. Um, we uh, lost the connection for some odd reason. Um, let me um, mention that I, uh, uh, sorry I didn't make it earlier this week to the Phobos conference, and, and of course uh, the survey forum this week uh, would have been just delightful to be there. Uh, but um, uh, I was very much involved in um, uh, the uh, 40th anniversary of uh, the Viking program. Uh, where Viking 1 landed on the surface of Mars uh, 40 years ago uh, yesterday. So, um, it, you know, when you think about it, in 1976, NASA put two orbiters and two landers in orbit and then dropped the landers, um, and therefore having two full orbiters and two landers on the surface all in one shot. You know, now currently at Mars, we, NASA has uh, three missions. Uh, and uh, two rovers, and it took us 10 years to pull that off. So this was uh, really quite a celebration and um, uh, well, well attended and uh, a very exciting uh, time to think back in NASA's program and, and to the heights that um, NASA can, uh, can actually achieve. It's really remarkable. Uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, quickly go through a number of things, uh, mission overview and upcoming events. We'll talk about the Discovery and New Frontiers program. I want to talk about the IATA mission. 
Uh, I also want to talk about uh, the planetary CubeSat selections. Uh, we made selections since the last survey meeting. I want to talk about those and then what our plans are for um, uh, the next solicitation. We'll also talk about the planetary missions uh, senior review and then I'll end with um, uh, the NRC uh, study uh, timeline uh, that uh, we're working towards. Uh, so here for your reference is our mission overview. It is missing one mission, which is the IATA mission. Um, and hopefully before we uh, get this posted, we'll be able to put that on. It's in um, formulation now. It is passed and is in phase A. And I'll talk more about that. Uh, but um, uh, we're doing uh, 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 really pretty well. And um, uh, we've got a lot, uh, a lot going for us and, and uh, some really exciting things I want to talk more about. Um, as an overview of some of those uh, milestones that we've met, uh, of course, most recently on, in uh, early July, we inserted uh, Juno into uh, Jupiter orbit. Uh, ESA indeed had a successful launch of uh, the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter. That will get into orbit in Mars uh, coming up in October. Um, we're, uh, of course, turning our attention now to uh, September 8th, which is the opening of the window for OSIRIS-REx uh, going to asteroid Bennu. So just a tremendously exciting time for us. We also um, have really uh, moved out in earnest on uh, Cassini beginning the plane change uh, in, the, in this maneuver, uh, this grand finale that it's going to do. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And uh, we, of course, late this year are on track for uh, the step two selections for our discovery program. So uh, once again, as an overview and discovery, um, we have uh, Dawn uh, LRO, and we've uh, delivered the Astrofio instrument to ESA, actually to ASI, uh, the Italian Space Agency, for which then uh, they will have um, their um, uh, instrument integrated with ours and delivered to Bepi Colombo. And then we have um, uh, InSight, which, which is now being planned for uh, launch in uh, 2018. Now, relative to the discovery selection, I'm sure everyone knows, but in case you don't, uh, here's a quick little overview of um, all those uh, proposals uh, that uh, all those groups that have been selected to submit a step two proposal. Uh, so we have Psyche, um, Lucy, NeoCamp, Da Vinci, and Veritas. Uh, the teams are working really hard. Uh, the uh, submission is coming up in the month of August. We'll go through the evaluation, and indeed, um, we are um, on track. Uh, to be able to uh, announce the selection of uh, which missions or mission we will uh, go forward with uh, in the December time frame. I'm, I'm confident that we can do that before the end of the year. So um, uh, we're on track there. Relative to the New Frontiers program, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Juno, we've, we got it in orbit July 4th around uh, Jupiter. Uh, just was a tremendous event. Um, uh, you know, Juno, um, uh, as it crossed the equator at Jupiter, was going like about 52 kilometers per second, which is just at an enormous rate. Um, and we had to just slow it down on the order of um, a handful of kilometers before Jupiter then could actually uh, uh, hang on to it and get it into orbit. It's in a 54-day orbit, and... Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what's uh, upcoming for Juno here next. Uh, also, OSIRIS-REx, as I mentioned, um, uh, September 8th coming up. Now, Juno, uh, really its science objective is really all about uh, the origin of uh, our largest planet in our solar system. We're quite interested to determine if it has a rocky core or not. Uh, we want to look at that interior structure. We have a number of instruments that will be making those kind of measurements, gravity measurements. Um, uh, we have um, uh, you know, Doppler measurements that will be made. Even the convection uh, that's in the upper layers of the giant planet uh, will actually perturb uh, the orbit and will hopefully be able to even get some indication as to the size and depth of the convection, the convection zone. 
Um, we're going to look at the atmospheric composition and dynamics, and um, uh, there's a lot of uh, particle and waves instruments on, so we'll look at uh, the aurora, and it's, um, it, of course, it's um, uh, the magnetic field and the origin of the magnetic field uh, within the planet. Um, all right, let's go to the next one. Here is an overview of the instruments. Uh, it has quite an array of instruments, nine instruments. Um, uh, the um, spacecraft is pretty big. It's using solar instead of uh, radioisotope power. And uh, it's primarily because of the unique configuration that we get it into. And so the overall mission architecture really lent itself for us to be able to use uh, solar panels. The instruments are designed for a spinning spacecraft. You know, so it doesn't have a scan platform, doesn't need it, doesn't have uh, certain features that we may be used to in, in our, our, large, our larger missions, such as Cassini or Galileo or others. And so consequently, um, uh, the mission architecture really lent itself quite well for the use of, uh, of solar panels. Uh, so that's, uh, that worked out really great. Here's uh, uh, an overview of the trajectory uh, that um, uh, we've gotten ourselves into. It's a 53-day uh, capture orbit. Um, uh, we will be in two of those orbits. Uh, late in August, uh, we will have our uh, first, the end of our first full orbit. Uh, the, all the instruments will be on. In fact, um, uh, they probably are all on by now, nearly all of them at least. Uh, and they're being tested and, and uh, uh, checked out. Everything seems to be going really great. Uh, and then, um, uh, then we'll do another burn and get it into um, a 14-day orbit. That's the blue orbits. Uh, we will do um, about uh, 31 or two of those orbits. And then there'll be a final orbit for which um, we'll uh, uh, ditch it in the, into Jupiter. Here's uh, the, an overview of the um, uh, mission architecture in terms of the 14-day orbits. Uh, it has a 30-second spin period. Perijove's really right off the cloud tops, about uh, 5,000 kilometers below the belts. Um, Jupiter pulls on the spacecraft, precesses the orbit. And so over time, that orbit evolution from uh, the first orbit to uh, 31st orbit, as you can see here, will start going through the belts um, and through the tough parts of the belts more and more. And um, uh, that's, um, that indeed will uh, limit the lifetime of, uh, of the spacecraft, even though we've got a lot of the electronics in a very large, what we call vault system, uh, to protect them as long as possible. So everything's going great for, uh, for Juno. Here's one of the approach images. You know, uh, to me, this is really pretty spectacular. When you think about looking at Jupiter from Earth, you know, we, we really don't see it from this perspective. You can see uh, uh, Jupiter in, 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 in its appropriate phase, along with the uh, Galilean uh, uh, moons. Um, you know, it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty spectacular, and yet it's still at this point was uh, uh, nearly 11 million kilometers away from the, from the planet. Several other uh, images now have also been posted. Uh, they're going to a major website uh, called um, uh, JunoCam, uh, for which uh, uh, the, the data will be dumped in raw form out onto the um, net, and uh, the public can, uh, can get uh, open access to them. Uh, we is we know that a lot of people are you know in the in the um, public just love to be able to get access to these and create their own products using a variety of software that's been uh, that 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 is um, uh, on the market or they've developed and this is much like how opportunity uh, and prior to that Spirit have worked over many years with uh, with the um, uh, public. Once again, just a really tremendous opportunity uh, for us to study the largest planet in our solar system. Here are, um, uh, over the last several years, from 2004 to the present, uh, the orbits that Cassini's gone through. And um, there's a little view here of uh, how that looks. 
Um, let me uh, go ahead and play that. Uh, you can see uh, uh, we've used, uh, through these nodal passages, really are where uh, Titan is. And we've used uh, um, Titan gravity assist to, to really get it into completely different orbits as it really is studied uh, the Saturnian environment. But Cassini, you know, is running out of fuel. It's coming down to its end. And um, in the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about its uh, finale. Um, what will happen uh, beginning in April is uh, you can see uh, two different classes of orbits here. One outside the rings. That will be a final orbit as it then passes by Titan. Um, uh, getting a, um, a gravity assist uh, will be uh, changing its orbit down into uh, those that go between the planet and the first ring. Uh, this is going to happen. Uh, the first event uh, uh, in this area will be uh, the 22nd and 23rd of April. So it, it, late in the evening on the 22nd in the West Coast, Early on the 23rd on the East Coast, we'll be passing through the ring plane. So this is, of course, exactly what uh, Juno is doing. And uh, these will be 22 orbits. And then we'll end uh, Cassini's life. It will be pretty well out of fuel at that point, And we'll uh, ditch it into the planet. And that um, is planned to occur on uh, the um, uh, 15th of September. So we'll have uh, two really spectacular outer planets missions operating uh, at, the, at the same time. OK, OSIRIS-REx. Of course, uh, this is all about bringing back an important sample from an important carbonaceous chondrite. Um, it will launch when the window opens uh, in uh, September 8th out of um, uh, Cape Canaveral. Uh, everything is in great shape. Um, uh, it will uh, get to Bennu in two years. So in 2018, after an Earth flyby in 2017, uh, it will get to Bennu. So we'll, we'll uh, starting obtaining some spectacular observations as uh, the spacecraft stays uh, with Bennu for well over a year. In the meantime, after the mapping and studying of Bennu, um, a site will be selected. Uh, it, it actually has a couple opportunities to get a sample. But if the first uh, opportunity goes down, it's a touch and go system. Uh, you can see in the lower left corner uh, the unit that then touches down to the ground. Nitrogen is pumped through the system. The material on the, the regolith, the loose material that's sitting on the surface, will, will enter into the container. And uh, if we do obtain a good sample right off the bat, uh, then uh, the other two um, opportunities uh, will not need to be used. Uh, we'll then put it into um, the return capsule. Uh, and then it'll return uh, in exactly the same manner as we did um, Genesis and Stardust. So um, really exciting time coming up for us. The, um, here's the delivery to the to the Cape. Uh, it it uh, was then unboxed, tested. It's in great shape. It is ready to go. So we're really quite happy with that. We're in the process of getting ready now for the next appropriate competition, which is in the area of the New Frontiers program. Uh, we've uh, you know, released some announcements that, that have come out over uh, the last many months. Uh, we have our well-focused theme list, uh, comet surface sample return, Enceladus lunar south pole, Aiken basin sample return, Saturn probe, uh, Titan, Trojan tour and rendezvous, Venus in situ explorer. And our plan is to get the draft AO out uh, this summer. Uh, we're actually pretty well on track. I believe we'll get out the um, uh, draft. Uh, uh, probably in the next uh, 30 to 45 days. Really um, quite happy of how that's coming along. And then our uh, intent is to um, indeed um, uh, release it officially in the um, 
uh, January timeframe. Actually, no later than January. We, we believe um, that um, uh, that will be easy uh, to meet. So um, plan accordingly. We'll, of course, do the normal pre-proposal conference, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, with a launch readiness date um, no later than 2024. Now, there's a mission I want to talk about. We've uh, entered it into uh, phase A. It's called the Asteroid Impact and Deflection Assessment, or IATA. It actually has uh, two parts to it, two missions. Uh, one is called uh, AIM, and the other one is called DART. And the mission concept that we're working on is joint with the European Space Agency. Uh, this mission concept is... Uh, really designed to test asteroidal impact mitigation techniques. Um, the kinetic impactor technique uh, is a, a critical one in our arsenal, and this will be a great opportunity uh, to do that. Um, the two spacecraft will go to um, uh, an asteroid, Didymos, um, and uh, it has a, um, uh, a, an orbiting smaller body. It is that smaller body we expect to impact with DART. That will be the kinetic impactor. And the AIM mission uh, from ESA will be observing the effects, observing the impacts. And uh, that data will come to both agencies. We'll do an assessment. We'll understand how the kinetic impactor uh, can be used as a mitigation strategy. So uh, this joint mission is in its um, uh, phase A, so it's a very preliminary concept, and both agencies are, are working it, um, uh, and uh, it's uh, coming along actually uh, quite well. Now I want to talk about uh, the uh, two uh, full mission CubeSats that we've selected. And we've also selected for tech development uh, three others. And this is in our last uh, Simplex call. Simplex call came out uh, uh, in 2014. Um, uh, the proposals came in. We made the awards last year. Uh, I've talked about this at several meetings, uh, but not at the last forum. So I wanted to bring it to everyone's attention. Uh, we've selected um, the Lunar Polar Hydrogen Mapper. Uh, Luna H, uh, Craig Hargrove uh, at ASU is the PI, and um, Josh Cowell is uh, for QPACE. This is a CubeSat particle uh, aggregation and collision experiment. It's all about accretion uh, from the University of Central Florida. And um, uh, the uh, uh, important um, uh, uh, Luna H uh, CubeSat will be launched uh, with EM1. Now that's our, uh, that's the first test of the SLS. So uh, we've got some great connections with HEO. We, we want to be able to continue to use that capability. The moon may be a very important uh, uh, planetary object that can utilize more and more CubeSats in the future. We want to take a good look at that. We've also approved um, uh, for um, uh, tech development. This is a one-year study only. Three missions. One is the Mars Microorbiter. Another one is a diminutive asteroid visitor using ion drive. And then a lunar albedo, hydrogen uh, albedo lunar orbiter. And um, uh, so these, um, uh, these three have already obtained the funding and are moving forward. Our next plan is to release another simplex call. We're working on it right now. Um, it's being designed uh, to be launched with Mars 2020. Uh, so here is a uh, sort of a launch opportunity. Uh, doesn't mean you have to go to Mars. Uh, if you can go where you need to on a trajectory that's, that's in that direction, then uh, that's also viable. Um, we're working on this call. I hope to be able to get it out uh, before uh, the end of August. So we've got another really great opportunity coming up. Now I want to talk about the Planetary Mission Senior Review. Um, the top recommendation from the Senior Review, which looked at nine of our missions in, in an extended operation, 
that top recommendation was uh, unanimous, and the panel believes that all missions should be approved for extension. Uh, here's the overall ratings. Uh, in that, Don was um, uh, looked at in two ways. One was to stay at Ceres. Another one is to leave Ceres and go to Adiona. Based on the senior review, uh, we've announced that uh, uh, Don will uh, stay at Ceres and complete its uh, uh, mission uh, there. So um, uh, that's, uh, that's completed, and I'm delighted to say we, we have the funding to move forward. Um, provided, of course, uh, Congress passes the budget with it, but um, uh, we're certainly uh, quite happy with uh, with the senior review results. Um, also, I want to mention that New Horizons and its extended mission was approved uh, to go to 2021 with the target flyby occurring in January, actually January 1st, 2019. This is a second Kuiper Belt object. It's much smaller. It's really like a building block of Pluto. It's on the order of 25 or 30 kilometers, whereas Pluto is an order of magnitude larger than that. I already mentioned Don will remain at Ceres. And um, uh, of course, uh, uh, Congress passing the budget will allow these to come into fruition. So finally, let me uh, give you an overview of uh, the NRC timeline studies that we've, uh, we've got going. Um, first to Cato, of course, went from to, uh, 2002 to 2012. Second to Cato goes from 2013 to 2022. So we're coming up to the midterm. Also, I want to point out that there's been a review of uh, applicability of CubeSats in all the fields. That's astrophysics, planetary science, heliophysics, and earth science. The NRC's completed that and, and uh, has published on their website the report uh, in May. The NRC actually has several open uh, reviews that are currently going on. One is in the area of extended missions, um, uh, and uh, their report is uh, uh, nearly done. We expect to get it in the September time frame. Uh, we're also right in the midst of the RNA restructuring review. We expect that report to be delivered to us in uh, December before the end of the fiscal, sorry, calendar year. Uh, we've also initiated another NRC study. This is about the importance of our large strategic missions. Um, and uh, that report, we believe, uh, if it stays on schedule, will be delivered to NASA in August 2017. So we currently have... Um, um, uh, worked with the CAPS committee. This is, uh, this is the Committee on Astrobiology and Planetary Science run by the NRC and have created a, a midterm uh, task. Uh, we're in the process of officially issuing that. Uh, we certainly will have it issued before September. Uh, that's necessary to keep it on schedule and get their report done by December 2017, which would be the, the midterm um, uh, 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 demarcation. And of course, uh, great input into that report will be all the studies from extended missions, large missions, RNA restructuring, and the CubeSats. And then let me remind everyone, the third decadal, uh, which begins in 2023 to 2032, we're going to provide the task by October 2019, and we expect the report to NASA in the first quarter of 2022. So that's, um, that's what we've got coming up in that area. So with that, let me just uh, end there and turn it over then to um, uh, Victoria. We'll do the questions then after uh, she's done. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Jim. And Jim, uh, when it comes time for questions, we're going to ask you to turn your camera on again because we lost it, and so we only just watched the slides while you were talking. Okay, but you don't have to do that now. We'll, we'll bring Victoria up first if you want. Okay, thanks for that talk. Hi, good morning. Last thing before lunch. Well, I have about 800 slides, and we will be going into detail on every one. So, um, now I want to thank my colleague, uh, Dr. Betty Siegel, who is the program executive for Survey in Human Exploration. She was unable to attend this meeting, um, and she found out that I was going to be here um, 
and asked me if I would give this talk. So I'm, I'm representing, you know, Human Exploration and Betty. Uh, and any questions you have should go to her. Um, no. <laughs> so um, thank you very much. I'm going to give you a brief overview um, of what we're doing in human exploration and then focus in on some of the things that I think are of uh, great interest to this community. So advanced exploration systems supports the efforts of human exploration at NASA by um, primarily developing technologies and capabilities where our goal is to reduce risk, lower life cycle cost, and validate operational concepts for future human mission uh, capabilities. We demonstrate prototype systems. I'll show you an example. Pioneer innovative approaches and public-private partnerships. Um, that's a big focus for us. We maintain critical competencies at NASA centers and provide NASA personnel with opportunities to learn and transform their skill set. We infuse new technologies and support robotic missions of opportunity uh, to fill strategic knowledge gaps. We have uh, several specific funding areas that most of our activities are binned into, mobility systems, habitations, vehicle systems. These are all uh, low TRL activities. Uh, foundational systems, which is a kind of a new topic for us um, that will help us get uh, beyond low Earth orbit, but are really, really new concepts. For example, synthetic biology is a topic we're pr pursuing. Robotic precursor activities, and then uh, the sort of architecture type work that you've heard about through, for example, the Human Spaceflight Architecture Team and the Evolvable Mars Campaign. This is an example of uh, something we've done, had a success at this year. So AES flies a lot of stuff on the space station. I think we have over 20 uh, operational payloads that we've flown uh, since this project began. This is the Bigelow expandable module. Um, it is a result of a public-private partnership between NASA and Bigelow Aerospace. And it is now a fully um, operational extension of the International Space Station. But why is this cool? It's a significant increase in the volume and usable space on the International Space Station, and you didn't need a space shuttle to get it there. OK? Packed it up in a relatively small box, got it onto station, hooked it up, and they're finishing up testing of it. And, and equipment and uh, some of the systems on the station will then transfer its um, it's uh, got innovative features for micrometeoroid protection, so it is safe and uh, in the event of a, uh, like a, a coronal mass ejection or other solar proton event, there's other areas in the station that would give them less of a radiation exposure, but this is safe for everyday use. So we're, we're very, very proud of that, and it was not very expensive at all for NASA. The Evolvable Mars campaign, you've heard about it. You saw an earlier version, the, what we call the squid chart. Uh, but what we, the point here is that uh, this campaign is not a monolithic design reference mission. It is not us uh, only developing one set of systems to go to one place to do one thing. It is advancing our ability to explore space both robotically and with humans over time, culminating, hopefully, uh, in boots on the ground on Mars. So you'll see several uh, different areas we're currently Earth-reliant. We'd like to go out farther, out of low Earth orbit, into the proving ground, which we call cislunar space, learn new things, develop those capabilities, and move ever onward and outward. Um, this is uh, a NASA's strategic objective at this time, is to, per is to pursue uh, this approach rather overturning the earlier uh, single architectures that you may remember. This is a backward slide. It's very funny because usually you start, you look at the left at what we're doing now and you're moving into the right in the future. Well, this is flipped to show that by building backwards across this capabilities, um, we're able to, uh, we're able to, on multiple paths, to get to the point where we want to be. So in order to um, explore Mars and the moons of Mars, we're doing the transportation al analyses. We're looking at how we can stage things on orbit and how these things will all use the systems that are under development and have the capability to be advanced, and that's uh, SLS, Orion, and those kinds of things. So how are we doing that? So what we're doing um, right now is, is across all those areas, 
is making investments. So AES are the bluey purpley boxes, and the Space Technology Mission Directorate are the pink boxes, and then the gray are things we haven't gotten to yet. Okay. So what we're doing now, for example, in crew health is uh, on the station, of course, uh, doing medical uh, studies with the astronauts, looking at the um, looking at the space station. I really enjoyed uh, Dr. Race's talk on planetary protection. There's stuff inside the station that's just really interesting, okay? And I think we would like to understand that better before we start living in places even, even longer and carrying them to Mars. So we're looking at this way of making um, discrete advancements over time making these investments. These are, some of them are very long programs. The radiation safety program has been in place in the human research program in HEO for a very long time and will continue. But what we're doing is we're understanding the behavior of the human organism in response to a radiation environment and we're improving our models and we're coming up with new ways to mitigate the effects of radiation and we're understanding more about how life responds outside of uh, uh, outside of low Earth orbit. So some of these are very, very long, and I can't say that we've done anything more than get a start, while others of them we expect to be able to make um, uh, much more rapid advances. For example, an exploration EVA, understanding how we can move in space. Uh, you saw some of those systems and some of those ideas when Mike Gernhardt if you were here for Phobos Deimos and saw Mike Gernhardt's talk. I've been here since Sunday, so it's like... Um, but the next point, as we get farther out, we get farther out toward Mars, we have to start understanding where our strategic knowledge gaps are uh, and start filling those gaps as we can. A strategic knowledge gap, and I know you've heard this and people are mentioning it, and it's something I'm very excited about because I hear it more and more. A strategic knowledge gap is definitely peculiar to human exploration. It's what we don't know in order to efficiently design the systems to enable the exploration by the human. You heard Jake was mentioning today um, about um, dust. You've heard other talks about that. Well, because of some of the research that's done, some of these, these dusts are highly toxic, as well as get it gumming up the works of your systems. So I have to ask a question. Who saw the Martian? Who didn't see the Martian? Spoiler, okay, he comes home in the end. Um, but I don't know about you, but when the, um, when the hatch on the HAB breaks, right, in that very exciting moment in the movie, did you not go, oh my God, the planet is trashed, you know? So um, we're, we're <laughs> there were aspects of The Martian, the movie, where those of us uh, in AES, we were saying, oh, we're, we're funding that and we're funding that, and oh yeah, we're developing that, and we've got a plan for that. And uh, I especially like the suit that he wore when he was outside that enabled him to walk like it was 1G, right? Um, sorry, shouldn't be taking shots at the movie. Um, but okay, so we're looking at the systems now and what we need to know about Mars and about interacting with asteroids. When we first started looking at sending humans to an asteroid, we talked about landing on it. So we got that out of our vocabulary because we're not going to land to on an asteroid. We're going to dock to it, anchor with it, you know, translate over to it. Because by using the right language, we're able to then look at the things that we needed to know. So these strategic knowledge gaps are really, really important because they're an effective way to harness the power of basic science to inform exploration. Okay, um, we are updating the SKGs. Uh, uh, Dr. Ben Bussey, who's out in Korea at a meeting and is very sad he couldn't be here, uh, is um, uh, updating the SKGs, working with specifically the small bodies in the lunar um, uh, um, analysis groups, um, SBAG and League specifically, uh, and the goal is to produce a fully searchable web page on NASA that will sh tell you what those SKGs are, the measurements are, and then we can also indicate when we've managed to um, fill a gap, even if partially. So um, the update objectives um, are listed here for you. 
uh, this is well under hand and in hand, and we hope to have this completed very soon. Now, we're always willing to entertain new SKGs. The engineering community, you know, the space flight development folks, the HAT folks, are always telling us, well, we need to know this and we need to know this. But it's also, we found, been very useful when the science community says, well, you know, have you thought about this yet? Okay, for example, the chemical composition of some of the um, uh, chondrite asteroids, had we thought about exactly what's in that stuff, okay, and what that means to um, uh, have as astronauts up close and personal with it, especially if they're bringing dust uh, back into the habitable volume of, for example, the Orion. So these are just a, a, some of the examples, and you've been through this before. Not everything has to be done in space. Research and analysis is very important. We can do ground-based research, uh, invest in the International Space Station, and we also need to know what the priority is um, how it's, and, and how long it's going to take. So, for example, I mentioned radiation. Radiation effects um, is just a very long, slow process to really understand. There are advances being made worldwide, but even the models sometimes uh, come into question and have to be, re re uh, the health effect models um, have to be reevaluated. Uh, a few minutes on what we're doing in terms of robotic precursors. I'm the robotic precursor domain lead for advanced exploration systems, so I get to talk about my stuff. Um, uh, very briefly, um, Mars 2020, uh, HEO and Space Technology are partnering with science um, on Mars 2020. We're funding three prime instruments. One is an in-situ resource utilization unit, MOXI, uh, and a weather station, META, and then we're um, uh, instrumenting the heat shield to understand entry effects. Um, uh, in addition to that, we also have got a series of CubeSats, and you'll be hearing about some of these on Exploration Mission 1, which will launch in 2018. Uh, BioSentinel will be looking at deep space radiation on yeast DNA. That's an Ames Research Center project. Lunar Flashlight um, is looking for volatiles. It's a really innovative and, and intriguing mission. The NEA Scout is going to do a flyby testing a solar sail. Skyfire is a, uh, a commercial entity, um, is a commercial effort by Lockheed Martin to test an IR imager, and then Lunar Ice Cube from Moorhead State. Um, so these, uh, along with, um, um, and it just went out of my head, I apologize, Jim, uh, the SMD-funded uh, Simplex missions will be launching, and it's uh, very, very interesting um, examples of moving CubeSats from an undergraduate effort to something that does move um, our understanding along quite rapidly. Resource Prospector, um, you heard about it from Dan Andrews and then from Tolly Colopri, but I'll just say that it's doing very well. This is it in pieces in a, uh, in a uh, thermal vac chamber. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about SURVEY. So SURVEY, um, Science Enabling Exploration, the efforts by the survey teams, and I gather that most of you all are associated one way or another with all of the survey teams, are not only providing uh, world-class science, they're also rapidly and efficiently addressing strategic knowledge gaps. So for example, um, uh, the Vortices team and Dream2, uh, Bill Farrell's team, are addressing critical SKGs about the moon and small bodies uh, that both have, uh, like, uh, direct application to the health of the human, as well as how we design those systems. Um, these slides are the slides that are shown at the uh, Advanced Exploration Systems mid and final year review showing, uh, showing the accomplishments of the survey teams. Uh, this investment is uh, uh, it is growing, I believe, the value of this investment and in growing as uh, the human ex like the human space like architecture team folks begin to understand that there is a source for the knowledge that they need uh, to design the systems that they've been asked to design. I'd like to talk about a couple of other things, uh, especially for the younger uh, types here, uh, about things you may want to be involved in. The NASA Tournament Lab is a center of excellence for collaborative innovation uh, that does a variety of calls throughout the year. There's challenges. There's even very tiny cash purses for those challenges. I'm proud to say that the uh, uh, Asteroid Data Hunter won a presidential medal 
uh, this past year for its efforts, and this was conducted through the Tournament Lab. You may want to take a look at that. And then the CubeSat Launch Initiative, uh, AES uh, and NASA have funded, um, somewhere on here is the number, um, launched 43 and has another um, 36 manifested. Uh, now, sometimes the outcome is um, we don't hear from the CubeSat again. Uh, up to, so there was one um, inadvertent joining of two CubeSats on orbit. Uh, they kind of stuck together. They didn't crash. They stuck. Um, and a few other things. So I think you might want to uh, consider that. Has anyone here um, join, you know, put in a proposal for a CubeSat? Excellent. Glad to see. Let's, we'll see. look for more hands next year. Um, so in summary, I just wanted to say again that AES is looking at specifically benefiting human exploration and that it requires science to do that. So this is a case in which science enables exploration. And then I want to do a whiplash segue for another minute. So yesterday, Noah, who I Noah Petro, who I admire intensely, gave a talk, and I was just loving every second of it. And then he was talking about the value of mentorship and how he came to be. And um, I actually talked to him about it, so I hope he's not too surprised. But here's what I want to do. I want to put a shout out for working for the government. OK, so as you're looking for it's hard to get hired, right? But tell me it's not hard to get a tenured position. So let's just say it can be hard to get a job. But I'd like to put a shout out for the challenges and the benefits of working for NASA, OK, or, or the National Science Foundation, right, for example, about uh, you don't, even if it's not your whole career, you still have the ability to do cutting edge research, witness Bill Farrell, Jen Heldman, OK, Sarah Noble, for example. Um, people who also uh, work within the system to enable the work of others uh, and to spread that out. So I just I wanted to put out a plea that you won't shut that door and that maybe you'll take a look at USA Jobs and if necessary you'll call one of us and say, how the hell do you fill this out? Okay, so um, thank you for your time, thank you for listening, and I'll take any questions. Victoria, thanks so much for that, for both from Jim and Victoria. Jim, could you please start your camera so that we can have you on screen as well? And uh, you can either go up to the microphone or if you want to play CubeSat, we have a microphone, CubeSat here, and just let me know and I'll toss it to you. Actually, I'm going to let Greg do that because he probably tosses a little bit better. Do you want to come toss the microphone? Okay, I'm going to wait for, for Jim to be, is Jim online yet? Oh, I don't know. Um, this is for both Victoria and Jim. So. Jim, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. So uh, I've turned my camera on. Um, it's the only thing I can do. There yeah. I am. Right. So Pamela Clark, JPL. Um, CubeSats have come, other, these rapidly developed compact standardized platform paradigm in some circles known as CubeSats have come a long way over the last decade. And I will, you know, there, there are at least 17 CubeSats sponsored by NASA uh, that are deep space CubeSats on my, on my list. I keep an, uh, basically keep an updated list of, of what's on. And that's, that, that's not to, to talk about the ones that haven't been selected yet for programs that are on the books to be announced at some point. So my question is for the new Simplex call. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I'd just like to ask if it's your, um, vision that some of those will actually be interested in going to the Mars system. And particularly for those, what's your thought about supporting the communication and propulsion capabilities? And also, Victoria, for the HOMD program, what's your sort of vision for what's next with, uh, with CubeSats? OK. Uh, thanks much for the question. Uh, what will be uh, in this call will indeed uh, have some government furnished equipment. Uh, JPL has developed a one cube Electra. And so uh, the CubeSat will have the opportunity to collect data and then transfer it through the Electra cube to the orbiters and, and leverage that infrastructure. You know, uh, Earth CubeSats are great. You know, we've got infrastructure capability. Uh, out in the solar system, it's tough. And Mars actually gives us the opportunity to leverage the existing infrastructure there, take a lot of data with CubeSats, and then get it back to Earth via the orbiters. 
Uh, so it's a pretty exciting time. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this particular call. So, uh, yes, uh, AES, Human Exploration AES do plan on funding additional rounds of CubeSats. Um, we're internally funding, dire we're directly funding the, the five that are going on EM1. Uh, this is in part to really leverage some investments both in COM uh, and just uh, uh, beyond low Earth orbit, those capabilities, especially the engineering know-how and things, to, so that we can pass it on. Um, I will tell you that one of the things we worry about, especially if you're, um, what I would say, you're in a transportation zone where you expect space, spacecraft to be traveling, I understand space is very large, but losing CubeSats um, on the way to somewhere when you expect to be sending more spacecraft, it, they become debris. And so we, we do, we have a lingering concern and, um, and a th something we want to work on is how to find them again so we always know where they are. Okay. Thank so, you. Hi, Jim. <coughs> Hi, Jim. I'm Ngoc, an intern at uh, Amin here. Uh, I would like to ask us for the new Frontier program of NASA. I do not see any mission to Phobos and Demos because, in my opinion, in some sense, Phobos and Demos contain an enrichment uh, science on both comets and uh, asteroid, and also it's a critical pathway for the humans to mark. So perhaps in the next decade, uh, that will be a prominent feature uh, going to Phobos and Deimos, uh, perhaps as a follow-up to uh, what JAXA plans to do, which of course is uh, uh, a Phobos uh, sample return. So uh, I would look forward to the next decade. Unfortunately, Phobos and Deimos are not in this uh, upcoming New Frontiers call. Uh, Jim Ed Brown University. Uh, Jim Green, thank you very much for a great summary of the SMD program. It's very exciting. Just had one question about the um, Discovery Mission down select. So I've heard discussion in the past that there's a possibility that more than one might be selected in this call, and I wondered uh, you. I did, couldn't tell whether you were leaving that option open or it's a possibility or or not. Can we just have your opinion on that? Sure. So uh, I'm not the selecting official. I'm going to do everything I possibly can do to make it hard for the selecting official not to pick two. But indeed, uh, that means I've got to demonstrate that I have the budget and uh, the schedule and the reserves uh, accounted for, accounted for uh, in, the, in, in our rollout. So um, we'll see how it goes. But um, uh, I'm, uh, uh, shall I say, um, uh, guardingly optimistic. Great. Thank you very much, Jim. Addy Dove, University of Central Florida. Um, Victoria, you mentioned, and this also uh, should be for Jim, use of the ISS as a resource for experiments, perhaps. Um, but one of the big challenges for that is there's actually no really good proposal mechanism right now for funding planetary science experiments on the ISS. So I was wondering if either mm -hmm. of you might be able to address that. In terms of like building an experiment and developing it, there's not a good funding source that would fit in a ROSES call, for instance. OK. Right. Uh, Fair enough. I mean, we haven't put out a salmon that says um, uh, we're seeking instruments for uh, the ISS uh, that support planetary science. Um, I will say that um, uh, as our budget continues to improve, uh, we might be able to find a wedge that would enable us in some way uh, to do mission of opportunities in SALMON for which then the flexibility would be there uh, to get any sort of ride. And that, that would then include uh, uh, a, uh, an instrument on um, um, uh, the space station. So um, uh, right now I just don't have the budget. Uh, I have to be... Um, as I said, guardingly optimistic about discovery, which means I've got to be able to hang on to the funding I have now that helps our wedge, that enables us to pick two discoveries. That, to me, is a top priority. 
Um, if that doesn't happen, then, then that opens up other options. And number one, I'm not sure of the answer, okay, and I will find it out. Uh, and I'll send it back, Greg and Yvonne, I'll send it back for dissemination. But n there are ways, okay, uh, but one of the things about uh, getting a package on the station is you're not necessarily in command of the schedule. Yeah. Okay. So that is an issue, right? But um, let me look into it, and I'll, I'll come back to the community with an answer. Okay. Yeah, because, for instance, there's a, in one of the astrophysics calls, there's a possibility of building a payload that you would go on the ISS. And part of that is because the budget for those calls, that call, is a little bit bigger. So okay. there's both the budget and having a science experiment in an amazing microgravity environment on the space station. So thanks. Doug Curry, University of Maryland. I uh, was wondering what the prospects are for uh, payloads that would go on commercial spacecraft. Uh, so once again, from my perspective, um, let me repeat, um, it requires a budget wedge. I've got to be able to demonstrate that we can put out a call for mission of opportunity and we have the associated money. Right now, my top priority is looking carefully at our ability to fund two discoveries. Um, uh, that will have to come first before then I can step back and look at the budget for uh, potentially a, a mission of opportunity call. And for human exploration, of course, we routinely send payloads up on commercial launch opportunities to the station. Okay, um, but there are various opportunities through rideshare programs and other things. So I. I uh, but we have not put out a call for that, so this is true. I will have to look. There's question number two, okay, that I will be answering, okay? Okay, we'll take two more questions, the two that are at the microphone. Okay, hey, Jim, it's Rick Elphick from NASA Ames, and uh, I just have a quick question, and I apologize if you haven't, if you already covered this, but I was wondering about the MMX uh, gamma ray neutron instrument uh, opportunity and what the schedule is for getting the that out on the street? So, um, uh, indeed, uh, we have uh, uh, been in uh, intense discussion uh, with JAXA. Um, we have identified um, uh, the funding to help support um, uh, those two instruments. Um, we are uh, in, that, in that cooperation waiting for uh, JAXA uh, to uh, confirm um, uh, their uh, funding level and making the appropriate announcements that uh, MMX is moving forward, and then we're all in. But no sense of when that might be at this point. Well, we're, um, of course, um, uh, taking JAXA's lead. Alessandra Springman, University of Arizona. I was wondering if there's going to be a balloon-borne or suborbital instrument program for planetary. I know there's one for astronomy, astrophysics. Anytime soon. Yeah, in terms of developing instruments for any of our platforms, and that is including uh, our um, uh, interest in um, uh, use of uh, balloons for planetary observations, uh, you can always propose to Picasso or Matisse. Um, we've actually uh, just um, uh, near the conclusion of a science definition team, uh, which will report out telling us um, the kind and types of instruments and science that can be done at the decadal level from a balloon platform. And with that information, uh, we hope to get that back out in the community uh, to provide uh, uh, upcoming opportunities for them to propose against. Okay, great. Well, before we thank our speakers today, I just want to remind everybody to come back at 1.30 uh, when we start up again promptly. And uh, to Jim and Victoria, thank you both so much for your support of Survey and for these great overviews you've given us of your programs. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you all.